I think we're going to look back on this with hopefully a positive component in that we did all return to food. We have all been cooking. We've got no choice but to cook. We've probably learnt to cook better, as particularly people in capital cities in Australia have probably learned to picked up a few extra skills. Um, and I don't think that that's just picking up the telephone or ordering Uber Eats. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Food, whether recipes or experiences, runs threads through generations, passed on from family member to family member, meals in the home transferred and continued on. Some families have influence on a grander scale, influencing the way we eat, not just in the home, but out of the home over generations too. Sam Gowing is a chef and founder of Gowing's Food, Health, Wealth and a clinical nutritionist. Sam, how are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. It's good to have you on the show. Your family has a fascinating history uh, with with food in Australia. Um, tell us a little bit about the history. So... In the 70s, my father, that's the 1970s, by the way, folks, um, my late father, Dennis Gowing, traversed from being a car dealer into a restaurateur, and uh, he'd always loved good food. Um, I think that was preceded because he was an orphan huck, and he came to Australia as a 10-pound pom. Uh, Beans out of a tin one Christmas day, and since that day, while he was still in the UK, that is, and on that day, he swore he would never be that poor again. And uh, I think that was part of his intention to um, eat well and to, I guess, manifest a life that he could be surrounded by good food and never go hungry. And I think that kind of went full spectrum. And in the 1970s, I think 1977, he opened a restaurant in Turak Village in Melbourne called Jackson's. And that's, yeah, I kind of grew up under the restaurant table and still am <laughs> <laughs> on a good day anyway. Well, do you have any stories from those times of what it was like as a kid growing up in that environment? Oh, look, some I can repeat and others I can't. But the, the restaurant was adjacent to a famous Melbourne identity. Um, she's a hairdresser and her name is Lillian Frank. And so she would have all the Melbourne society coming in for a, for a fro or a new do or whatever was going on at the time. And then they'd either pile into the restaurant before or afterwards. So it was very much that kind of late 70s, um, not the heady days of the 80s, but it was certainly very chic. And more importantly, the food scene was really starting to to grow up in Melbourne. The surrounding restaurants were um, more posh, for want of a proper description, such as Glow Glows and uh, and Fanny's, if, if your listeners remember Fanny's, and of course, Florentino in the pre Rossi era. So, so in that era, it was um, kind of pre-Californian cuisine and seeing things were just starting to change in the Melbourne food industry from my perspective as a child, but also retrospectively now that I have kind of grown up a little bit as well. But, you know, the, the restaurant food was, I, I don't forget it. I can't forget it because it was chocolate souffle, crepe Suzette. Um, there was a vegetarian avocado which was fanned on a beautiful plate and believe it or not had a kind of like a sesame, almost like a Japanese sesame um, goma dressing and I can remember that plate huck so clearly and to this day it's sort of something I do in the food that I've, I've merged on or emerged to do in the last 20 years as well. So, yeah, there was a firm imprint there, that's for sure. When when did you first realise that food was a, a career for you? Well, as a child, I learnt to cook um, by my father's side, but also my maternal grandmother was a wonderful cook and I think my father even paid her to teach me to cook. So, yeah, and I, I started cooking when I was about six and we had many a Le Cordon Bleu, um, I guess they were magazines, they were almost like a manual. Um, I remember when the first Vogue Entertaining came out and uh, the American Gourmets. So I, I think it was always inherent in me. And my first dish was a, or my first failure was a pale pink, well, I think it was actually a hot pink, cochineal infused uh, meringue. 
pavlova that I didn't realize I had to close, keep the oven door open at the age of six or seven. Um, and I think that's just was kind of in the genes, really. I don't know. I always wanted to have a career in food, Huck. But as a young girl in Australia, there weren't many opportunities locally. And to be perfectly honest, and I hope this still resonates with some people, I was too terrified as I grew up to go and work in in the kitchen when I finished HSC. I ended up there, but um, it was such a male-dominated industry, of course, is what I'm trying to say. Tell us about when you finally did get there. What, do you have memories of the first time you worked in commercial kitchens and got your career going that way as a chef? Well, the interesting thing is that I started my apprenticeship on the restaurant floor, in fact, in the public bar of our hotel in Mount Macedon in 1984. And I failed at um, art school, which is what I enrolled in when I finished HSC. I went to a boarding school and I wanted to study fine art ceramics. But the course that I enrolled in was more about architectural drawing and so forth and perspective that it wasn't for me and I was hopeless at it. So I kind of ended up, ended up you know, in the family business and um, got shipped up to Mount Macedon where we had the pub and my father had formerly lived there uh, in a beautiful home on the main road in Mount Macedon. And I cut my teeth under the tutelage of my brothers learning to pour beer and uh, make Midori-infused cocktails and serve <laughs> or learn how to open a bottle of Tisdall Mantel and Fumé Blanc. That was the first bottle of wine I think I ever opened formally. So I gravitated to the bistro of our pub and learnt the floor and then eventually they let me loose in the kind of more fine dining restaurant that we had there which was called The Green Room and I learnt service, table service, uh, restaurant service. And then I moved back to Melbourne to the city to, to pick up my Japanese language hack that I'd studied at school. And I got a job running a Japanese restaurant in South Yarra, um, above the old deli for those that live in Melbourne, on Turek Road, opposite, sort of opposite Francois. And much to your um, amusement, I changed into a kimono twice a day, shuffled <laughs> along the restaurant floor in getter in the wooden thongs and the wooden sandals and the socks and the obi and the whole shebang and learned to cook uh, Japanese food at the table, the shabu shabu, yosanaba and, and sukiyaki and, and used to hang out with the Japanese staff. And one of our waitresses, Michiko, speaking of stories, she... I didn't realise for about six months she used to have to fit me into the kimono for the first month because I had no idea how I was going to wear it. But I soon realised that she was necking the cooking sake from out the back from about 11am. <laughs> so I'm not sure what was more amusing, her half cut on the cooking sake or me strutting around in a glorious Japanese kimono, um, probably about five to ten kilos, maybe not ten kilos, but five kilos heavier than I should have been and very, very curvaceous and um, and a bit busty as a, as a teenager. So that's not really very Japanese at all. <laughs> oh, dear. So then from there, sadly, my father was diagnosed with cancer in 1985 um, and I moved over to work with him and be trained under his staff at Gowing's Restaurant in East Melbourne, which at the time oscillated between a two to three, two and a half hat um, restaurant. And I picked up the trade there on the re again on the restaurant floor. What was it like working in uh, a, a restaurant of that uh, acclaim, uh, even though it was in the family? Was it was it different to the experiences that you had had? It was fantastic because I really, and still do, but really loved the hospitality industry. I really wanted to sink my teeth in it. I'd already done a couple of years, I guess, in a way, and I just thrived on everything. I just kind of I picked up the mantle and ran with it. And um, the staff, they took me on as a proper commie waiter. And my first job, of course, was pouring water and changing ashtrays. And then I was allowed to, you know, change the tablecloth with that, the magic way that you do that. And I just was slowly allowed to carry a plate and clear a plate. And I just loved it. And my father and I were very, very close, Huck. So to be near him most of the time was great. But he was also um, slowly dying of cancer. So that was also very, very challenging and um, very distressing for all the staff and uh 
and management and the chefs too because they often got the, the dark side of them as well. How have you seen hospitality change during your career? Well, in the pre-COVID era, so, you know, all sympathy and, of course, and compassion right now, but I feel like hospitality shifted, particularly from my perspective in Melbourne, it changed from actually being hospitable to the nth degree in that, you know, the Italian and European waiters would migrate to Australia and pick up that profession. And that was what they would always do, you know, and even now waiters, I think we're well into their 60s, if not sometimes into their 70s, still working the floor, some of the staff that I work with. So it was to be a professional wait staff was a career in itself. And I think, sadly, somehow that kind of got a little bit um, diluted by you're not just here for a career, you're going to go on to other things. So I feel like the profession front of house um, has diminished slightly. I don't mean the management and so forth, but the actual joy of actually going to work and running a restaurant or being part of that kind of old-fashioned team, I think that's changed. Um, quite dramatically. You spent a lot of time and you're award, an award-winning restaurateur. What were some of the highlights over your career before you made a, a big change to move to where you are now? For eight years, my brother and I owned and operated the Grace Darling Hotel in Melbourne, so from 1990 to 98. And one of the greatest blessings was uh, – taking the keys lock, stock and barrel on the 24th, I think it was, of September at midday. And I instantly became a Collingwood supporter, Huck, because the football team was formed in the cellar of the Grace Darling and so I had to convert immediately. And uh, about 10 days later, they won the grand final. And so given that it was in the, you know, it is in the heart of Collingwood, the street went bananas and, of course, the pub went berserk. And um, to this day, I think those scars of the champagne corks on the ceiling of the public bar area are still there. That was a highlight and that was a real blessing. And the next eight years, um, through recessions that we had to have and uh, recovering from pilot strikes in the 80s and so forth, it was a great a great achievement and a lot of um, blood, sweat and tears went into running that pub with my dear brother, Chris Gowing. Um, but we had a ball and we picked up a chef's hat throughout that journey and the 3AW Pub of the Year and Restaurant and Catering Awards, I guess, and wine lists. And But, you know, the best award was the, was the, the patrons. You know, they were just fabulous and some of them I still connect with today. What led to the decision to leave your sort of fast-paced city career and, and go down the direction of, of health and well-being? So towards the end of the 90s, when Crown moved across the Yarra River to the, the premises they are now, that being the casino, you know, we, we really didn't think we could survive or be up against the juggernaut that was Crown Casino in those days. And we'd seen what happened with the Southgate and South Bank area of Melbourne where there was a restaurant precinct and a lot of our inner city um uh, friends, colleagues and other restaurateurs had also suffered greatly with this kind of expansion across the Yarra in Melbourne. And we didn't think, to be honest, that we'd get a resale of uh, Lock, Stock and Barrel as good the following year. Had we have known that Lion Nathan were about to come in and spend millions on it, then I, would have, I wouldn't have done it. But that was... That was the catalyst. My brother was keen to kind of look after a younger family and change pace and uh, it took me a while to come around to it. But during that time after I'd lost my father to cancer, I felt I had a duty of he uh, care huck to um, think about the food that I was carrying out on the, you know, from the kitchen and where were the trans fats lying and, you know, how much deep fried food was on the menu and, and could I possibly healthify some of that food? And my own sort of health and fitness journey was starting to um, unfold before my eyes as well. But really doing that in 1996, for example, in a Bluestone pub in Collingwood would have sent me down, you know, certainly the wrong path. So 
that was a catalyst. And then in 1999, I launched um, what was food and health, but it became food, health, wealth because people wanted a lot more product development and mentoring and so forth to help them survive in business as business has changed in hospitality and wellness over the last 21 years. This episode is proudly supported by Montague, handpicked for you. The things that we're really looking for in plums, first of all, they've got to be sweet. We're really looking for a full flavour explosion um, in our plums. Red flesh is critically important to us, higher in antioxidants, so all that good stuff. And then we're also looking to add a slightly firmer texture. So there's a little, almost a little crunch. You know, that's a real driver for us. For more information, go to montague.com.au. You uh, retrained as a clinical nutritionist. Tell us about what impact that had on the way that you um, use and see food. It it did, and it it was really an extraordinary um, aha moment, which people do bang on a little bit about, but it really did happen to me. On the first day, I think, or the first week of enrolling in one subject of nutrition at what became Endeavour College, which was then the Melbourne College of Natural Medicine, there was a wonderful lecturer talking about food as medicine and the phytonutrients within certain ingredients. And it just was if Oh, not even the penny dropped. It was like a whole bag of money dropped. It was like, oh, my God, there's just so much more to what I thought I knew about food and particularly what I tried to learn about cancer and and nutrition, and that was it. It was just a pivotal moment that I can almost remember exactly the colour of the chair that I was sitting in and the blackboard. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of like, you know, those thunderbolt moments. If there was a cartoon, it would have been a lightning strike, I'm sure. <laughs> And that that really ignited my passion, you know. It was like, this is my life purpose. This is what I've come to do. This is all the knowledge that I've had and the food service and so forth. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make healthy eating popular and get hospitality to get behind it and know that produce and seasonal produce and the healing properties that lie within are going to be celebrated on the plate rather than just on the hippie trail. And that was 1999. Tell us about the challenges of trying to introduce that approach during that time. It was really hard because I was just faking it till I make it as well, you know, but <laughs> I'm making it up as I go along, which I still do in some areas of my life, I can assure you. But I just knew, I, I knew because I was studying nutrition and that was a naturopathic college and we were all kind of hinting that the wellness industry was about to become a trillion-dollar industry. And for me, maybe I had my father's entrepreneurial bones. I just sort of put two and two together and thought, you know, if I can really stick this out, if I can get as qualified as possible and get people to listen and get people to really take notice, then hopefully they can have a happier and healthier approach to food. But it was challenging. I mean, people used to tease me and say, you know, what on earth has food got to do with nutrition and restaurants, or what have restaurants rather got to do with nutrition? And even the lovely Matt Preston used to tease me because I had a cooking class called Don't Panic, It's Organic. So he thought that was hilarious. You know, here comes Don't Panic, It's Organic. And I just said to him, you watch, son, one day, one day, and sure enough, you know, uh, he can eat those words. <laughs> well, you've established yourself as one of Australia's leading spa chefs and um, all about food is medicine. Well, tell us, what, what does that mean? What is a spa chef and, and how does food work as medicine? So looking at um, in the global um, perspective or from a global perspective, the resort and spa industry and the wellness industry globally is uh, – Humongous, it really is. It's a thriving industry, and people don't just go to destinations these days just for the view. They don't just go for the hotels, they often go for the spa treatments, such to countries like Thailand, Bali, and so forth. And so, what I was seeing on a more international scale was these. Uh, resorts were still offering kind of just like pineapple juice or a basic salad as their healthier option on their kind of spa or healthy breakfast menu or something like that. So I really saw a niche in the global market that if I could take my restaurant skills or my hospitality training and background and service into a global arena, then chains, uh, resort chains such as the Four Seasons and the Grand Hyatt and so forth 
would eventually listen and they did and just before the pandemic I um, was the wellness chef for Club Med Asia Pacific and hoped to pick up that mantle again when things um, settled down a little bit but that job entailed uh, creating a vertical offering on their large buffet menu of which has 2,000 different menu items uh, per week that's on rotation throughout nine Club Med villages and trying to healthify um, those menus and the offering. But also one of my greatest achievement, achievements was getting margarine off the menu. And that's just a little sachet, you know. Here, use a bit of coconut oil. Surely there's a coconut tree somewhere. So they're the small, it's the small wins that have the big impact. Tell us about um, some of the ways that you healthify uh, food and keep them um, balanced and delicious. Do you have some examples of some of the, the, the menus and items you've, you've created? Sure. So depending on the client and depending on, you know, the location and so forth, for some, for some of the clients it is simply, well, not simply, but it is as fundamental as removing some of those highly, highly processed hydrogenated fats off the menu. That can be a huge thing and getting people to see the seasonality or, or to understand that what is growing locally is actually fabulous for them. Now, in some regions such as the Maldives, a lot of that food is flown in from either Dubai or Singapore with the two resorts I've worked with, one being the Six Senses and the other, again, is, is Club Med. So it's a slow step, but also it might be that their fish dish, a certain fish dish that they will already have on a plate, on a, on a menu, can be reinterpreted and bringing in some other elements. So they might have some Japanese seaweed just from the base of their miso soup that we can then reconstitute and put through just a simple local salad. Not about being Japanese, but to boost the nutrient value and to help alkalize the other ingredients that are around that and to boost the minerals, as I say. So often they've already got those secrets in their pantry, sesame seeds and all the nuts and seeds and so forth, and then helping them or reminding them that sometimes steaming is a healthier alternative to deep frying and how couldn't they do that in a banana leaf or something like that. Just some broad examples. You mentioned that you had a role with Club Med previous to the pandemic. What sort of impact has the last year and a half had on you? Well, it was massive. I I lost 83% of my business um, overnight, like many people in various capacities and various uh, facets of industry. For me at the time, my resort and spa work was global from Berlin to Mexico to Maldives, etc. And the event business, particularly in Byron Bay, uh, where I was living for many, many years, for 14 years at the time of the pandemic, that has pretty much still collapsed. So any corporate event that's come in has had to be cancelled or rescheduled into 2022. So those for your listening clientele, then, uh, you know, those tickets are around anywhere from 200 to 250 per person. So if we have, you know, a group of delegates, 100 at, at once, then of course, there's usually a very good margin there. And like any event workers, your listeners will know, it's all in the pre-production, you know, the rollout day is sometimes the easy job, give or take a few glitches. So that really um, evaporated and I thought I could pick it up again, but in the last couple of months, it's really, you know, collapsed and I've just had to uh, resolve that that's possibly gone for quite some time. Um, and I have pursued other areas and picked up other, I guess, strengths of the business in order to survive. What sort of impact has it had on you personally and, and how are you feeling um, about the next sort of phase once we move beyond COVID? Well, I was vaccinated for the second time on Tuesday and that's pretty topical up here in the Byron Bay area, um, particularly this week anyway. But... I feel like from a health perspective, last year was pretty tough, my um, emotional, mental health. But then, you know, things started to open up. And for me, I was able to increase the teaching load that I have. I teach online with Le Cordon Bleu and develop other online content as well. And so I kind of went from an events 
um, business and cooking school into a content creation business, um, which I actually really, really enjoyed doing because I quite liked tinkering away at the computer and all of that kind of thing. So once I knew that I would be okay financially or emotionally, then things picked up. But I was previously a yoga teacher and I'm still a great yogi at heart and the compassionate streak in me is very, very strong. It's a river that runs very deep. So to see uh, friends uh, in Canberra where you are, uh, are about to obviously um, go through some different situations of Sydney, of course, and my dear, dear friends in Melbourne just suffering so much, it just breaks my heart. So that kind of secondary emotional impact is still quite massive on my psyche and self. You've always been at the forefront of um, leading people down a more positive path in, to, in regards to food and, and very much you've written prolifically about the future of food. Do you think these circumstances have changed our perspective on the role that food plays in our life? I think if anything, and from my observations and recent courses and just seeing what my global student, students are doing, I think we're going to look back on this with hopefully – a positive component in that we did all return to food. We have all been cooking. We've got no choice but to cook. We've probably learned to cook better, as particularly people in capital cities in Australia have probably learned to picked up a few extra skills. Um, and I don't think that that's just picking up the telephone and ordering <laughs> Uber Eats. I think there's been a bit more, you know, oh, maybe I could just make this, obviously the sourdough thing, right, you know. So... I think always looking for the positive spin. I think we will see it. I think we've also realised just how good this country is, regardless of the current immediate circumstance, but how beautiful this country is, how much talent we have in our industry, how people like you and Danny Vallon are just so fundamental for holding this industry together during these terrible times. And I think people are going to start to realise the value of the industries at a whole, whether that's primary industry, um, not just our farmers, but that farmer's market component as well, and into the detrimental effects that the whole of food service is suffering. I think there's going to be a compassion and a sympathy, but also in turn a greater support in the years to come. With everyone um, suffering so much and obviously the unknown still happening, but, but food being at the core of everything that we do, what's, what sort of advice do you have in regards to treating food as medicine to help with mental health and, and change diets um, moving forward for everyone? I think if anything, we've got time now, at least hopefully for the next you know. Well, Hopefully not too more, too many more months, but you know there is still some time to actually really tune in and observe that anxiety. And again, this is probably my yoga hat, not just my chef hat, but you know really observe how you're feeling. How's that food making you feel? Making you feel? Are you having too many processed foods? Is have you just resorted to the complex carbs day after day? Is if that's what your budget can can afford? Absolutely, but trying to do a little bit of test and measure on yourself. You know, how do you feel when you eat those green vegetables versus how do you feel when you have less, last night's leftover spaghetti that you can't be bothered putting in the microwave or whatever you're going to do to reheat it. You know, it's like really tuning in and going, what's going to make me feel better? Do I need just a little bit of a pick-me-up, some ginger tea, lemon juice and hot water? Do I need to pull back on the grog? Can I do some breath work around that? You know, can I just focus on maybe two glasses enough today as opposed to the whole bottle? Or just setting some positive um, goals, I guess, which I know is really hard and it sounds very um, woo woo. But to be honest, it can really, really help if you, you know, if you want to get trashed one night at home, go for it, but maybe just take it easy the next time because. Again, a bit by and by for you, but the woo-woo and the, the vibrational energy of just kind of constantly adding more toxicity to a body that's already pretty fragile and frail and uncertain can do a hell of a lot of damage. So just kind of being a bit nicer to yourself and trying to afford and make time to eat, be friends with a few more vegetables, I think is probably the best advice I can give at the moment with good cheer. 
Well, Sam, it's been an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear your story. I know you've got many more, so I'd love to catch up again down the track. Um, please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. There are a few more up my sleeve, let me tell you. <laughs> Huck, thanks again for all you do for our industry. It's just, um, I know that's it's just very fractured and fragmented at the, at the moment. So thank you for all the um, support that you offer. Thanks, Sam. Keep in touch. Okay. Bye. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.